Welcome back to this live broadcast of the SME Conference and Expo 2021. This is the second edition. We had the first edition last year, and it has been a great learning opportunity here and engaging and exchanging of ideas. And we have some uh, some various exhibition stalls at the KICC where we are, uh, where we are having different organizations, SMEs and MSMEs, uh, showcasing what they have to offer. So you definitely want to get an idea of what this is about. And just to point out that we are very deliberate and keen and vigilant about observing the COVID-19 containment protocols. And so we invite everybody to walk along with us. For those of us who are in the audience, I'd, I'd request once again just that we ensure that we are having our masks on and having them on properly, that we may ensure that we are sanitized, have our hands washed, and observe the social distancing. The, the seats have been placed in a way that is going to ensure that you are compliant to the same. So we've made it much easier for us. It's an open, it's, it's a well irated space, so it even makes it easier for us to have these engagements. And now we get into our final discussion of the day and of this uh, conference. And we, sh but beyond today, we should still have the, the various stalls and the exhibition stands uh, being operational where you can go and engage them. Here at KICC, it's free of charge entry for you who's in the public and for everyone else who's here as well. So I now uh, introduce our, uh, my panelists, um, those of them who are with us here. Uh, right next to me, we have Benjamin Abongo, who's the operations manager at CAPEX. Uh, we then have uh, Fred Waswa, the Group Ch Chief Executive Officer of Octagon. And then we have Stanley Karanja, the Head of Group Business at Madison Life Assurance. And we have um, Jairus Musumba, the Nairobi County Acting County Secretary. Thank you for joining us, gentlemen. We shall be having, uh, we're expecting two more panelists, but before we get, uh, before they get here, we can get the ball rolling. And as you can see, this panel is quite heavy on the financial services aspect and so uh, it's a platform where we believe we can have some good engagements in terms of if I was an SME, my money, where should my money go? And, and I'll just begin with uh, Benjamin <clears throat> and just for the record, each of us has a microphone, we are not sharing microphones and so that is why it's safe for us to even keep our masks off on stage, they are sanitized and even after we're through they shall be sanitized. So. Benjamin, and I'll ask the same question to Stanley as well, especially because you're both in the insurance space, and it's something we addressed with AAR yesterday when they were on our panel. Why should these SMEs and MSMEs that we're talking about care about insurance? Why should they um, get into the insurance space? Because many people, when it comes to insurance, it is the one on the car, because if you don't have it, you're going to be arrested. So why should they care about it? Uh, thank you. Uh, uh, the most important thing that we need to understand, even before we answer the question why, is um, we need to understand really what an SME is. The word SME has been coined from three uh, simple words. The first is S, which means small. Uh, the second word is micro and the third word is enterprise. Now when you look at these three words, they can be defined statistically in the sense that in a small, we have an organization that employs between an individual and not more than at least nine people. Uh, from that point, we move to the next, which is a, a micro, which employs 10 people up to uh, 50 people or 49 or thereabout, and then above that is an enterprise. Now, one of the most important issue with this group is that it is an economic hub. Actually, our vision 2030 uh, enshrines uh, financial inclusion as an important aspect of economic growth. And if we look at the SME, it comprises about 60% of our employment capacity and contributes nearly about 40% of our GDP. So it is an area of economic importance and therefore as people who work in the financial sector, this is an area that we need to pay more attention to. Now the, to the question why insurance? In fact, uh, the reason why we need to engage this group in insurance is because 
Number one, if we look at the first category of one to nine employees, these are usually family businesses. And as usual, family businesses are exposed to a lot of family risks. These businesses usually start on an innovative platform, but finally they end up dying because of uh, the family problems or the family deficiencies, especially in management of an innovative process. Uh, when we look at uh, the, the micro uh, bit, which is between uh, 10 to 50 people, uh, this group of uh, uh, enterprise of, of institutions are a bit more pronounced. Some of them may start having a little capital, they may start having certain structures, they have products that are running, and these products need to be sustained because uh, any business operate in an, in an environment of risk, and therefore the exposure to the business needs that you need to protect it against unforeseen circumstances that may end up destroying a business. One of uh, the problems that we have had recently is the disruption that has been brought to us by the pandemic COVID. And we saw that a lot of businesses in the malls, if you went to, to River Mall, you went to all the malls, they collapsed. For uh, many months, they were not able to operate. Such businesses, if they had insurance, like for example, uh, business interruption insurance, they would have their uh, risk taken care of. Uh, if they had disaster insurance, they would have those ones taken care of. So insurance is an important uh, thing for any business, whether small, whether medium, or whether it is an enterprise. Most of the enterprises, because of their size and formation, have been able to put in place uh, practical insurance solution that have been able to sustain them. Uh, they have a lot of... Uh, uh, like, for example, fire and allied insurance that takes care of burglary, takes care of flooding, it takes care of all those kinds of risks. But when you look at the SME, uh, the most important insurance that has been there is uh, life insurance that covers credit risks, personal accident. But there is more to that that we need to look at, especially when we get into any form of business. We need more innovative solutions solutions that will bring an on inclusive insurance platform at an affordable cost so that the businesses which are started on innovation can be assisted to grow. Uh, on a global platform, we know that SMEs are important uh, and especially they, because they stand on innovative platforms, they have a good network which is coming from the social media and we have seen a lot of SMEs, if managed properly, it can become very, very good enterprises for economic growth. So we need to protect them from the beginning. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, Stanley, just briefly make your case for why should SMEs care about insurance? Um, the same thing I asked him, and welcome very much for uh, keeping a teach um, for joining us. Thank you very much. Um, why should SMEs uh, care about insurance? Uh, maybe I need to explain um, the concept of insurance. And insurance is a mechanism of risk transfer. So for me to explain very well why SMEs should take insurance, maybe it is important that I bring out the risks that are likely to be uh, facing these uh, small and medium enterprises. One of the risks is financial. Depending on the business you're in, um, the capital outlay required uh, may be very huge or very small. Now, raising that capital is a big challenge. So how do people get into businesses? One is probably savings. Um, the second one is probably taking a loan from a bank, fundraising from a family um, or friends. And once this capital is uh, put in, then it needs to be protected. For instance, if you've taken a loan from a bank, you need to ensure that um, several risks are taken care of. One of the main risks is illnesses. Um, my fellow panelists has explained, if a family um, runs a business and there's a sole proprietorship, in case of illness to the main person running the business, then that business will close. Um, all the capital already raised will be used um, to take care of medical bills. Um, 
you move to the next step and you look at it. Um, in case of death uh, or any other challenge, then the person may be unable to uh, continue to pay the loan or to return uh, money is borrowed from friends. So the financial risk um, can be very well uh, be mitigated if you have insurance. We have other risks, and I think uh, my fellow panelists has also uh, talked about business interruption. A small shop um, can easily get uh, caught by fire, and uh, the stocks are destroyed. These are the things that we deal with on a daily basis. Um, you have um, issues of burglary or theft. Um, you, you fundraised, you've bought stock, and uh, one fine morning you wake up and everything has been stolen. So those small risks, um, as small as they may look, uh, they are very real, and because on a daily basis, if you walk into police stations, you find those cases being reported and businesses being completely uh, destroyed. Now, there are many other risks. Um, uh, in the recent uh, past, we've seen uh, flooding. So you built a house and uh, a building that you're getting income, or rental income, or where your business is operating from, and uh, one fine morning wake up and you find um, changing weather patterns and the rains come and business is destroyed. Again, these are small risks, uh, but importantly, can be mitigated uh, by having insurance. So why should we, um, in the SME space, have insurance? I would take a bet that in every house there's an umbrella. And that umbrella may not be used on a daily basis, but when it is needed, uh, one works with an umbrella. SMEs need to look at insurance from that perspective, something that you must have, because um, there's very many risks uh, facing the business, and as, as an entrepreneur, one should focus on taking the main risk, which is a trading risk. All the other risks um, can be taken care of uh, by insurance. And that includes employees, um, as I've indicated, injuries, um, includes uh, product liability. Uh, you could wake up and sell somebody a product that continues to affect them and um, a case comes up and, um, again, capital is wiped out. So if you all do have umbrellas at home, you should have insurance because that is what will protect you when those other risks um, come up. Okay. What you should take care of is a trading risk. All the other risks, um, transfer them uh, through uh, insurance. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And um, uh, Bono also wanted to comment on that. Yes. Thanks, uh, Dan. Um, I, I think the small medium enterprise, I have been there, I have run my business since two, 2007, and I started with about 500, 500 square meter, uh, 500 square feet in terms of office with three staff. And sometimes people will come to me and say, please take insurance. And I'm asking myself, so if I take insurance and pay the premium uh, and I don't have any claim, my money goes. And that is the biggest question that all of us who are running small businesses. Because you, your money is very precious. Uh, you need to buy product and sell. But somebody is telling you, take the money you're buying product and buy insurance. But one day, I woke up one morning and discovered that my staff are sick and they need to go to hospital and I don't have a cover for them. And they come and say, please give us some money to go to hospital. I didn't have enough money. So they have to be off duty to look for money to go to hospital. My clients need to be served. Now, those are the challenges we need to be able to sort out. Now, uh, I know that some insurance companies now are coming up with products where if you pay the premium, by the end of the year, if there's no claim, you get a percentage of uh, a refund which is used for the next premium. I think that will help to make sure that we as small, medium enterprises are comfortable that we're not just throwing money and we're not getting a claim paid. And that's what I think uh, normally the SME will have challenges with. Yeah. Thank you very much for that, uh, Bonawaso. I want to quickly cross to Dr. Julius Kipnye Teach, uh, who's joined us. Thank you for joining us. Um, he's the Regional Chief Executive Officer of Jubilee Holdings. Um, and just, yes, for the benefit of uh, avoiding assumption, we have sanitized everything, we have given distance, so it's safe to have your mask off, and you're using your microphone alone. 
We've heard what uh, the two gentlemen have spoken about, uh, the, the need for insurance for small businesses. For you who leads a team that is not only in Kenya, um, in terms of SME uptake of you know, insurance, what do you see when you compare Kenya to the other countries in the region? Okay, thank you very much and uh, welcome SMEs. Uh, you are the ones who keep Kenya going. I know sometimes you look at the big boys and uh, make the assumption they, they are the ones who are the key drivers of Kenya. But uh, as the minister said yesterday, 98% of the employment in the country is you people, SMEs. 98% of the employment. And so therefore, it's my kudos to you. Now what we are lacking, and I'll just mention three things. There are three things that are strategic and important for us as a country, as uh, Dan said, from my own experience. Number one, we have a strategic risk that we don't pay attention to, which is where do SMEs plug in from a policy perspective? In America, they have a ministry called Small Business Administration, because in America, 90% of the employment is SMEs. So they have a minister in charge of SMEs, sitting in the cabinet separate from a minister in charge of commerce, uh, separate from a minister in charge of international trade, things like those. It is a separate ministry. And it's one of the things I've been singing about for our own country, that we need a minister in charge of SMEs alone. Because their issues are unique and different from, say, Jubilee Holdings. The, your issues and Jubilee Holdings are very different. So we need a minister in charge. Betty is sitting here yesterday. Our mind is thinking of exports, flowers, uh, industry, the big boys. Now, to concentrate on the small people requires a very different mindset. So that is why we need a separate ministry. The second issue is the greatest risk at company level for SMEs is governance risk. You, have, you face a huge governance risk. Most of you run very successful small businesses at your family level. But remember, it's only you who is running the business. Now, the day you are not there, the business collapses. That is governance risk. Now, I, I used to sit on the board of a venture capital fund, and we were looking for potential businesses to invest in. Now, money was available, but there was no company to put money into. And I know most of you will be looking at me and say, but my business requires capital. Now, the challenge is how do you marry the people who have money to those who need it? And the, the bridge is governance. Because when a venture capital fund or a private equity fund comes to you, they want to do a due diligence. A due diligence is a detailed analysis of your company. And the first thing they look at is governance. How is this company governed? Most of you don't have a board, and you don't have to have a very big board. The, the new companies act allows even one director. Now you can, my recommendation for SMEs is at least have three, yourself and two other people. And preferably, don't be the chair yourself. Be the CEO, but have a neutral person checking on you. Now, a, a venture capital fund is looking for a governance structure that, that your company records are kept well, that there are minutes of your progression. Because when somebody is from outside, there has to be a record they are looking at. The due diligence is your record. What are you looking at? So we need to then reorganize yourself. And then the other thing any person who is willing to fund you is looking for audited records. And they typically look for three, three years. So, if you don't have audited accounts for three years, you are unlikely to be looked at even by a bank, 
or anybody who is going to inject capital into your business. And the third aspect of governance risk is succession. Most of you, you run the business, you are the only one who knows, even your children or your spouse doesn't know. The end result is if you are not there, if you are indisposed or you die, unfortunately, then the business dies because you are the only one who knew. You didn't have even a board. There were no records. So that is where the problem is. So most of you are transitioning from where you are to where probably people like Fred was were there, okay? So you are now moving to large enterprise, but with structures of a micro business. And that is where the greatest risk lies. And the third one is medical. I think uh, the panelists have talked about medical a lot. Please, can you go, if you don't have medical insurance, can you come to Jubilee tomorrow? Please. Because as the largest medical insurer, I have seen grief by SMEs, where the founder, the owner, the everything in the company is indisposed. They have no medical insurance, and some of it could be 10 million required. What are you going to do? So if you buy, for example, a medical insurance cover of, say, 100,000, you qualify for a limit of 10 million. Now, for you to raise that money immediately is very difficult. So please take insurance. The purpose of insurance is to transfer the risk to somebody else. Please don't see insurance as a waste of money. See it as a risk mitigation measure. And the most important is medical insurance. If you take medical insurance, okay, it means you can be treated quickly and you come back to the business as fast as possible. So those three things, and I want to repeat them again, at national level, let us lobby for a ministry of small business. They have it in the US, the biggest country in the world, the largest economy, as a ministry for SMEs. We need to do. A few countries like Mauritius have taken it very seriously. Remember Mauritius has the highest per capita income in Africa. Jubilee is there. And the second one is governance risk. Please go and reorganize your business. Focus a lot on having a board, having procedures. Most of you, you, you mix family money and business money to the extent that nobody knows. Come uh, to Nataka Pesa, you go into your pocket. And then Shika, that's not how to run a business. Everything must be through your bank account. And make sure you have clear succession procedures and then take medical insurance. If you do those three things, you will have mitigated a lot of things that plague SMEs in our country. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Ari. Some very insightful thoughts. And um, before I come to the county government, I just want uh, to bring in Fred Waswa from Octagon to just touch, on, just pick up from where uh, Dr. Kipnia teacher has left off. We have um, this, all this money that we are making but one thing that has been reported by the central bank is that our savings culture in Kenya is not as good. And at times, a lot of these things are coming from an aspect of people do not understand. When it comes to the financial services space, um, gentlemen, I must say, your, your space is full of jargon. Mm -hmm. A lot of big words, uh, risk, compliance, um, claims, premiums. Mm -hmm. And some of the people we are speaking to, you, you have spoken very well to industry peers. But when it comes to the people who you're actually hoping can now take up the insurance, they hear big words and they say, Izotta Chia Kina Waswa, the ones who have on your meomoka, as they say that. So maybe just speak to us briefly about the importance of you know, financial literacy and how we can actually boil down this kind of language to a, to a language that can actually be understood by those beyond who we are used to speaking to. Okay. Um, uh, thank you very much, Dan. Um, I, I think I would like to pick up from where Dr. Ari Kimnetich has just left uh, and support the fact that we actually we need a ministry that takes care of SMEs. As he, as he said, in the U.S., they have a whole ministry for small business administration, which we need. 
Um, and that will also help us in terms of how do we manage our money. But I always say that uh, money is a very foreign thing to us. Uh, in, in Africa, what we need is, is cows and goats, you know. And then we ask to, to use money as a medium of, of trade. Um, and when you are asked to use money as a medium of trade, you are only told when you have left or leaving university until you can start a business. The only time you have managed well or you have tried to touch money is when you are given pocket money. Now, in, if you go to America, to Europe, they start teaching children financial literacy programs at age seven. And that's what the international uh, requirement is. At age seven, you start teaching your child how to manage money. What is money? Yeah, how do you make money? That's the, st the stage we need to be able to start at. And if we start there, we will start developing a culture of engaging money in a proper manner. Then when we get to universities, and when you leave university, you are told you can start a new business, you can start a small business, and you actually go and start a business. We have very many young people who are doing business now online and are making money from online programs. But they are not managing their money properly because, as Dr. Tad has said, they use the money to buy food. It is never going to the bank. It straight comes into their phones from America, from Europe, from Asia, because they are doing business online. The thing is this is that we need to start having programs at an early stage. Look at how we started our agriculture. When I was in school, a very young child, in primary, lower primary, I was in a, 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 a club, 4K club. And 4K club was, was helping us to understand how do you farm, what do you farm. So you start from there, you are learning, oh, you can actually make some farming, you can make some money out of the farms. We need to go there. We as Octagon Africa, we have taken it up as our CSR to help start 4K clubs, but not necessarily for agriculture, but for financial literacy. So we can help people, children from standard seven, from, I mean from age seven, in terms of financial literacy, which is very important. Because money, if you don't manage it well, it manages you. Uh, I always tell people that if you are used to managing money of 10,000 and you get 100,000, you will spend all of it in three days until you get to 10 and you discover it's actually getting finished. Why? It's because you don't have skill of managing that very particular financial uh, literacy money. So we need to get financial literacy programs in schools, in primary schools, not secondary schools, not universities, in primary schools to inculcate the culture of making money. How do you make money? You don't make money quickly. You, don't, you make money by selling, buying and selling. You don't make money by becoming an entrepreneur. That's where the challenge is, is that we know only how to make quick money, shortcuts, but we don't know how to grow money and grow wealth. And that's what we need to be able to start helping our people so understand. So just on that one, yes. but some may argue that we do have business education. Um, as much as it's not one of the examinable ones in the uh, lower primary, the advice of the government was they should be taught but non-examinable. Are you saying that the business education as you know it is insufficient? It is actually very insufficient. If you look at the business education that we are learning today, it's about bookkeeping. It's not necessarily about how do you manage money. How do you make money? I mean, we need to start small things like, you know, you can be able to have a saving, you, children savings. You know, you know uh, uh, there are connections that have children savings accounts for banks. Children savings. And you start at that very particular level. I started having that for my children at the age of 10. So they have, a, they have a box where when we give them money to go to school, to have to eat, to buy food, when they come back, you ask them, how much money have you left? Are you left with? Put in that box. So at the end of the month, tell them, we're going to you to the bank to bank this money in the bank. So children start learning small things in terms of management of money, which is very important. Thank yeah. you very much. I want to bring in um, Dr. Musumba. And <clears throat> a challenge that many of these... So uh, SME operators would have, uh, they'll have, they'll be seeking their financial literacy understanding, they'll now get the understanding of uh, the need for insurance, ETC. But now when they begin to do the business, the county and national governments are going to come in with a raft of taxes and levies, and it has actually been said in the panel before and even in yesterday's discussions, the taxes, the, the requirements from the governments you get to a point where you're like, so where will my profit come from? 
So from where you sit as the acting county secretary for the, of the capital city the, of the county of Nairobi, what is being done to try and give some reprieve to these SMEs, if anything, let me not assume something is being done, if anything, to give some reprieve that they can actually feel I will get into business and I will also, I, I will not have such a difficult time to put bread and butter on the table. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, first, I must start from um, the perspective of how we tax our people and how we, we make a budget and how we come to a conclusion uh, on uh, how much we should uh, charge a particular rate. I would advise our people, because when we, we are doing our, our making of uh, uh, taxation, we go through what is called public participation. We go to our people and we tell them, this is what we have suggested to be taxing you on these different uh, types of businesses. And it is after we have agreed with them that we now come to the assembly and request the assembly to pass this uh, uh, revenue bill. So all the taxation that we do to our people have gone through a process and have been accepted. But that said and done, uh, we have um, laws, I'll give an example of uh, the Disability Act. It uh, waives taxation on, uh, on, uh, on this, uh, 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 these people. So what I'm trying to say is, uh, for us to come up with a waiver, it has to go through a process that is within law. As a count secretary, I cannot be able to make a decision on waiver unless it has gone through a process. So if it is done within that process, then we are going to be able to give uh, a, a waiver. So my question is, um, the act, when it's still a bill, it's a, it's a proposal that the executive has influence on. And when you listen to the ground, don't you feel then, as much as it goes through a process, the executive can try and contain some of this before it even gets to the process, so that you kind of nip it in the bud before we even get to the point of public participation um, by virtue of, you know, you've said there's a process, but you can, there's a place where the executive can come in and kind of forestall that kind of frustration. Um, as I've said, budget uh, process takes time. And before we make a budget, we have activities that we budget for. And before we come with these activities, there's what we call an annual development plan, which, is, which also goes through a process. We go to our people and tell them that these are the activities that we want to undertake within your wards, within your sub-counties. And they, they approve those activities. After they approve of those activities, we put it in our annual development plan. Now, for us to be able to achieve these activities that have been approved at that level, we must have money. So we give money to, the, to these activities. We, ex we estimate the monies that we need to do these activities. And now we go back to the same people again when we are doing budgeting to be able to uh, achieve this mandate they've given us. So we also tell them that at the beginning, you approved that we should be able to do this within this year. Now, this is the amount of money that we want you to give us so that we can be able to achieve this, uh, uh, these activities. After that, we take these proposals to the people's representative at the assembly level. We cannot, uh, we do a proposal to the assembly. We don't actually approve what we propose. So we take it to the people's uh, representative at the assembly level and they approve so that we can be able to use. So what I was trying to say is that uh, we have a process that we are part of. We, are, we have a process that uh, every one of us is part of. So let us be part of this process. And if we find that there's an area that we would have wanted to be helped, then we, we say during this process, and after it has been approved at the assembly level, then we'll be able to act on the proposals from the assembly level. OK, we'll come back to you. I want to uh, bring back um, Wanabongo. And as we're talking about the money that the businesses have. So at a point where I feel I've, I've made a bit of profit, um, I want to 
um, pull, plow back some into the business. What options, gentlemen, are we looking at for investment as a small business? Because there may be the perception that I will invest when I get to making revenue of 100 million shillings. That's when I can invest. So then what, what about the, smallest, the, the smaller businesses? Yeah, thank you so much. I, I was watching a clip, uh, I think, the other day, and somebody was trying to uh, compare a black American rich man and a white American rich man. And one of the things that he brought out very clearly is that the black American rich man confines his risks to himself. He grows his business to become rich so as to support his family alone. Uh, when it comes to the white, rich American, what they do is that as they grow from the nascent uh, stages, they establish networks. Now, when you establish a network during your period of growth in your business, you spread your risks. Other than spreading the risks, you also bring in new expertise that may not have been available in the family as the business grows. Yes, you came up with the business idea, you implemented it. That as that business continues, you need more uh, ideas into the business, you need more capital, you need more uh, technical expertise. So as SME businesses, what we need to embrace is that our businesses need to grow and they need to grow in an environment where we need a multidisciplinary uh, uh, we need to take a multidisciplinary approach when we look at what level of capital will be required what market will we want to go into what products will we want to diversify into and um, what risks we are faced with Insurance comes in handy because it increases resilience. What insurance does, it gives you an opportunity to venture into certain investments that you would have considered much more risky. Other than that, insurance also uh, gives you the opportunity to think of putting certain investments which sometimes if you asked your family, they would tell you, no, we can't go that direction. And therefore, if you establish a good network in a SM, an SME situation, what will happen is that you will be able to find people coming in to boost your business in a number of ways. You will find your business growing and expanding to come out of the scope of SMEs. Insurance uh, all over the world is developing solutions. Uh, as I said before, uh, initially we used to rely on personal uh, insurances like medical, life, uh, last expense, accident. But today we are developing more innovative insurance solutions that are all inclusive, that can take care of all your uh, insurance needs by only having one policy. So when we do that, then you will be able to see how to grow your business. In fact, as you begin a business, one thing that you need to understand is that that business needs to grow. As Dr. Kip Ngetich said, that the government needs to provide an enabling environment. Infrastructure is critical if your business has to grow. The government has to provide uh, road networks, uh, telephones, uh, tax incentives and waivers, and all these things are necessary. Uh, I know, as uh, Dr. Musumba has said, that the county governments go to the people as they make laws, but they also need to understand that as businesses come, they need to be nurtured. We need incubators so that people's ideas can be converted into noble ideas that generate employment, that generate income, that contributes to the county uh, GDP. And therefore, it is important that we need to look at the small and micro enterprises in a holistic way. If we look at them that way, then we will be able to see where we are going, not where we are. Because where we are is that they are just small businesses, they are our ideas. But the thing is that these ideas need to contribute significantly to the national economy. That is when we can be able to achieve our vision 2030. Okay. I think Stanley wanted to, and also Dr. Musum wanted to respond. Let's start with Stanley, then we can go to Dr. Ari. 
Thank you very much. I think uh, Dr. Kipnetich had raised this, that for businesses to grow, particularly the small and medium enterprises, they need good governance. And with good governance, then um, there will be a plan. All businesses do have plans. So when you're talking about savings, uh, there are only two ways of growing. It's either savings or borrowing. So small and medium enterprises, uh, many of them are generating cash on a daily basis. Now, with good planning, then businesses will determine, do I want to invest for a year? Do I want to invest for five years? What are the projects I want to be doing in two, three, four, five years? Once there's a plan, then um, insurance solutions are available, um, offering those short-term or long-term um, uh, savings. Uh, for instance, uh, and I think we've seen this as uh, we continue meeting with our friends in business, some businesses generate a lot of cash, and uh, without proper planning, cash is divested or invested in other areas that are not directly related to the business. And when a business has um, challenges, then those funds are not available um, to support the business or to continue trading. So small and medium enterprises owners need to ensure that first of all there's a financial plan so that as cash flow is coming in, then that cash flow is put in um, products that are one, giving good returns so that you don't lose out uh, to inflation, two, funds may be available when needed uh, by the business, and three, to ensure that the business will meet uh, their growth objectives. So the solutions are available, short term, medium term, long term, and I think it's just for the businesses to see it and align uh, their needs uh, with the investment opportunities available. Thank, thank you. you. Dr. Musumba? Uh, thank you very much. I wanted to chip in on uh, what he had um, uh, asked. Actually, we are working on a, a trade policy, a county trade policy, and some of the suggestions that are coming up is that uh, startups should be given a grace period within which to come to a, a, a certain level of uh, uh, amount of money that they are uh, having before we start to license them. So we are working towards uh, uh, that. Maybe you could expound on exactly what, uh, before you license them, so is it that they'll operate before licensing? Yes, they'll be given a period within which to bring up their levels of uh, um, uh, the money, the, what is it called? The, not capital, the, the turnover. Turnover. Turnover, yes, the turnover. So when it comes to a given level, now they can start to be licensed. Because if you license a person who is still down, you might not get him the next time. So they'll be given time to, to come to that level. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Kipnia Teach, I saw your hand was raised earlier on when he was speaking about um, people understanding and literacy, about financial literacy. You had some input on that. Okay, thank you very much. I think, uh, you see, literacy has to be made as a culture, not an examinable subject. There's a difference. You see, the Kenyan way of doing things is they see exams as a punishment. So go and cram and reproduce, and it's the end of it. What Fred Waswa was trying to impress on is a culture. A culture is an entrenched habit, something which is habitual. Okay? And those habits take the form of the values that are in, in, implanted on a child or the behaviors expected of that child. So if you start early and you tell the child, this is good for you, in the same way we say, wash your hands, it's good for you. But if you make it an examinable subject, it is unlikely that people will have an uptake of business. It's like learning CRE. Does learning CRE make you a Christian? No. It's just an examinable subject, and you learn the Bible and reproduce in an exam. Hope you pass. The way we need to teach business education is entrenching it as a way of life. Because people manage money every day. Okay? Capital is used in our homes every day. So it has to be habitual, and, and, then, and something which is habitual and is entrenched is a culture. 
So that is what I wanted to say, Dan. Thank you very much. What's I, I, I wanted to, I wanted to just contribute to the where do the SMEs save? I mean, how where are the investments in terms of uh, avenues? Um, as an SME, I think the critical bit is, of course, when you are starting and you are an SME, cash is a challenge. But whenever you have some return that comes through, it's important to understand that one insurance you need to get some insurance which means money going out without necessarily having an immediate return but providing a risk but the other bit is about the long-term saving is that uh, when i started my business i i thought i'm going to run my business until i get to age 70 and 80 but i have reached somewhere where i'm you know the business has grown we are now in east africa we are in zambia and i'm asking myself i should be looking at retirement then i ask myself but what am i going to get money what am, where am i going to get money in retirement. And that's why you find, I, I, look, I always compare with the churches, where you find a pastor who runs a church and runs it until they are 90, because that's the only source of income that they can get. But if you are able to save a bit of your money in a retirement savings plan, and which the government has now provided incentives for that, then it means that at a certain particular time T, when you are tired, you can actually go away and start earning, making, I mean, making an income from your savings, and leave the business to grow and give you more money uh, when you have developed structures like the way Dr. Tara mentioned. So it is important to have that. Now the only challenge that we have, again, is the platforms for savings. Because we have younger people, we have people who are running businesses all over. The question is that we're no longer wanting to go to a place where we fill forms, you know, that fill, uh, uh, form filling exercise. No, we have developed pro platforms like Mobikes as at Octagon, where you are able to save, you, you, you join, you sign up online on your phone and start saving on your phone. And then you want to withdraw, you can withdraw on your phone. So it becomes very easy for you to save wherever you are, whatever you are doing in life as a, as, as a business. So it is important that we look at these particular platforms for savings. Yeah, thank you so uh, much. Bonawaswa. Um, that's, that's the reality we are in now, that we are having a lot more access to savings. I don't know, I don't know how many of us here have been in a banking hall in the last five months. You know, um, people, even ATM cards, you find they have ended up becoming, it, it expired. And unless there's some, maybe you want to do an online transaction, then you realize it expired. But now the concern comes when we talk about, you know, there's the efficiency and the convenience that comes with saving online because it's, it's a quick dial of a few buttons and you're good to go. But the safety, we've heard of people saying it was 3 a.m. and I got a message saying X hundred thousand shillings has been deducted from your account. You're like, but I was sleeping. If anything, my dreams should not be about withdrawal, they should be about deposits. You know, so we've got people who are losing money um, because of hackers and the likes. So as an SME who says, okay, I'm going to start saving on these online platforms, what do I need to be alive to, even when I'm engaging a certain company or organization, to use their platform in okay. terms of safety. Okay. I think one of the uh, uh, things that you look at when you are starting to save in, on a platform, first of all is that that platform has, a, has an entity that is running that platform. It's not just wake up in the morning and it's a platform. So that the entity is there a regulatory environment around where you are saving. So somebody doesn't just come to you and says, no, I have a platform called X. Please sign and start saving. The thing is that you need to save in a regulated, a regulated environment where there are certain risks have already been managed. For example, the retirement benefits environment where you have a custodian, a fund manager, and the administrative aspect. So there, the risks are mitigated to a certain extent that your money, if you, are, if you want to access your money, there are certain levels of checks that must go through before you actually access your money. So a regulated environment is a critical bit in looking for where you are saving. For example, retirement benefits or insurance, where there are regulations in terms of how do you have your app running. It must run a product that has already been approved and regulated. But then the other aspect is the fact, is the, is the fact that this, the app must, have, must be run on a platform 
home that is more secure in terms of in terms of IT securities. So you can ask for what are the securities that you have gone through in terms of IT to be able to make this app to be secure, which is which becomes very important. And those are the things that we go through when we are developing apps, uh, especially for savings. Yeah. Okay. Yes, but uh, Musumba, then you can. I wanted to come to um, Abongo, but let's go to Musumba first. Yes. Uh, thank you. I needed to to emphasize what the county is doing to help businesses in Nairobi. And we have many things we are doing uh, uh, to make sure that uh, the atmosphere of doing business in Nairobi is conducive to SMEs. Uh, I'll give examples. Uh, we have come up with uh, so many uh, 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 markets where we have now uh, stores where SMEs can trade. Uh, and to make it um, uh, youth friendly and uh, women friendly, uh, in these markets we have lactation centers to encourage our women to go with their children to those uh, markets. We also have um, uh, manufacturing uh, uh, incubation centers. We have two manufacturing incubation centers. We have one in Karioko, another one in Jog on Jogo Road whereby uh, the county and the national government have partnered to give machines and training to our people. I'll give the example of uh, Karyoko, where we have uh, uh, leather manufacturing. Our people take their, their skins, they are uh, manufactured, they only take the pieces to go and uh, uh, finish in their, in their shops. We also uh, have come up with the business information centers. We have a business information center in Westlands. We have one in CBD and Karandini, the new market, where our people can come. Uh, some people do not start businesses because they don't have information. We have found out. So we are calling on our people to come to these uh, business centers where they can get information on business. We can train them so that they can have startups. We can uh, look at uh, if they have entrepreneurial skills so that we can lead them towards what they can be able uh, to do. We also have uh, uh, trade information centers within the county where we can uh, give you uh, business information. Come for it, we have it uh, within uh, uh, the county government. Then, uh, with collaboration with the national government, we are also... Uh, Having, we are going to provide modern facilities for production uh, focused on Juakali. We are going to help the Juakali people to be able to move from where they are to the next level. Uh, we also have the same, this is metal, we also have uh, furniture along Jogorod, we also have to have the same. We, want to we have them to improve from uh, being at the level they are to a higher level so that they can even be able to export their products. They don't have to sell their products only to us. So, um, with this in mind, I believe we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot at the county level, at our trade, uh, our trade offices. We have trade offices in all the sub-counties. The, the headquarters at City Hall, but we have trade officers at all sub-county levels. So, I would urge our people to go to these uh, trade offices to get information, uh, to get help. We have people there, we are ready uh, to help you to be able to start up your businesses. All right, Bonabonio, briefly, so we uh, close. I would like us to get into a short session of question and answer. Yes. So um, after he speaks, we are going to, and also Dr. Kip Nyotich would like to speak. After that, we'll have uh, a few of us who can come to the podium here. Um, it's sanitized, then you just ask your question, after which it will be sanitized once again. Um, so Bonabonio, briefly. Yes, just to go back to uh, the issue of uh, savings, uh, saving is one of the important tools which help us to accumulate wealth uh, for future investment. And therefore, as SMEs, uh, what is important is that as we think savings, we have to think of safe, safe platforms where we can save. Uh, I remember sometimes when uh, the banks were refusing to accept our savings because our salaries were small and we could not maintain uh, minimum balances in those accounts, then equity came and saved us. Uh, one thing that you should understand is that when you transfer your money to a saving platform which is safe, then it is underwritten at that point. 
if somebody who is unscrupulous gets access to that money when it is, say, for example, with a registered pension, and pensions, for example, for your information, operates under protected funds, any money that has been transferred to a pension fund is very safe. Any money that has been transferred to a registered banking institution is also safe. But what happens with SMEs is most of us prefer using shortcuts and we go to pyramid schemes and our money get lost there. Or we use certain online platforms that are not assured and what happens is that people go in there and hack them and then you lose your entire savings. So it is important for us to verify where we want to save because without saving you cannot build enough um, uh, money for future investment. So be sure that if you want to save, if it's a pension scheme, is it registered? If it's a bank, is it a, a credible banking institution? If it's a microfinance, is it a deposit taking? Is it registered by central bank? Is it regulated? Who is the regulator? And how safe do you think when you put your money there, you'll be? Because uh, without mobilizing that savings, you can also not access certain credit facilities that you will very much require to improve on your business. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Keeping a Teach. Then we can begin having our Q&A. Okay, Dan, there are two ideas I want to give uh, our brothers and sisters in the SME business. Just food for thought. Uh, the first one is on dead assets. Okay. So I, I know most of you are looking at me as, okay, what's a dead asset? It's an asset which is not generating income for you. And how do you measure it? The minimum you should always accept, and is accepted in finance, is treasury bills. Treasury bills is the minimum any asset should give you. Because you are lending money to government, and they pay you right now is around 6 to 7%. Any asset then that gives you anything below 6% is a dead asset for you because you would have invested that money in treasury bills and you would have gotten 7% trouble free because government is constitutionally guaranteed to pay you. Now, so I want you to make a list of all your dead assets and that now becomes inefficient capital. And if you aggregate it for the whole economy, how many inefficient assets do we have as Kenyans collectively? And let me give you examples of these dead assets that most of you have, which can free, if you sell them, they can free and give you capital to then multiply your business. How many of you have a house in the village? And you are paying rent here in Nairobi? Okay, I can see a few. Uh -huh. You see, many dead assets. How much did you invest? Two, three million. If you had put three million in treasury bills, it would have given you how much? 210,000 every year. But that house in the village, who are you keeping there? A houseboy. When, uh, when it's leaking, the houseboy calls you and say, uh, to my pesa. So who is the boss? The person is living in your house in the village. You are hoping to go and live there when you have retired. Okay? So the guy lives in your house for 20 years, taking care of it, and says, to my person. The houseboy is the boss. Now, there are so many dead assets in our country. If we just free that capital, you can imagine the, 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 the savings we will unleash to expand our businesses. So that is one. So do asset rationalization and say, how am I freeing my assets and how am I using them? Most of you, for example, have plots all over the place. Most of these plots are dead assets. They, they, you are hoping that one day a thicker road will pass there and then you get a capital gain. But uh, there are no thicker roads that will pass all over the place. The second idea I wanted to bring out, and this is now for people like him in government, I was there once, is the value of aggregators. You see, <laughs> there's once I read a book uh, called The Mystery of Capital 
by a fellow called Hernando Soto. He's a former governor of Central Bank in Peru, and he used to work for World Bank. And he said the difference between third world countries and developed countries is the way they mobilize capital. That's all. The way capital is mobilized in that economy. Now, we are very inefficient mobilizers of capital. And I'll give you an example, uh, which is an industry in Kenya, which is a very efficient mobilizer of capital. And that's the tea industry. I want you to study how the tea industry works for you to understand that actually if all our industries were working like the tea industry, Kenya would be very far. And that is KTDA. If you just understand how KTDA works, and if all industries work like KTDA, we would work magic in our economy, the value of an aggregator. Look at the tea, the average tea farm, a small holder, has only a half an acre. Just half an acre. That's the average. But that half an acre of tea is the best quality tea in the world. So my job as a farmer in Muranga or Kericho is just to deliver my tea into a buying center. And that's it. KTDA comes to pick that, processes it through your own factory. Remember, the factories are owned by the farmers. And then they aggregate and market them to Pakistan, to Egypt, to UK. It's distributed all over the world as aggregate. So we have an aggregator that then delivers that. So one problem that we did in our country is we killed aggregators. And that is why I'm arguing for a ministry of small business to then protect aggregators, create them and protect and classify them in various industries. So most of you are in industries which are very disorganized. So there is no support mechanism for you to scale to global stage but still remain as an SME in Nairobi. That is where the problem is. I would like, for example, the county government of Nairobi to influence the formation of aggregators. A market center is an aggregation, bringing people doing similar things together so that when the customer comes, it's a one-stop shop. So the value of aggregation, if we get aggregation right as an economy, as a country, we will have put in place a very strong foundation for then SMEs like you to take off. Thank you, Dan. Thank you very much. And now, uh, like us, have our first question on our Q&A, uh, the gentleman called Patrick, I believe, who has a question um, to put to the panel. You could. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, the SMEs. Uh, thank you, the panelists. As you have been told, I'm Patrick Nyangweso, the Chief Operations Officer for KNCCI. Now, I have three specific questions to our uh, beloved panelists. And I want to thank you. You have been very, very, very smart engaging the SMEs on practical aspects. What affects the SMEs, the practical issues? Now, my first question goes to County Secretary, and I want to encourage SMEs, don't fear to raise up your issues. This is your chance. Yes. Now, for the County Secretaries, uh, recently for last year, as a strategy to really address the issues affecting the MSMEs in the country, the national government came up with the initiatives, what we call the economic stimulus. And this one was really focusing on supporting the small, I mean the micro enterprises. How have you really repositioned yourself, especially in your next financial year, to support the micro enterprises? Then another question on, uh, still on the county, uh, county secretary. Every county government has established uh, what we call the SME fund. What is your experience as Nairobi County with this fund, the performance? Then uh, my next question goes to uh, Dr. Rick Ngeti. Insurance has been perceived by micro enterprises as a, a den for the bourgeoisies, the big guys. What strategies is insurance companies putting in place 
to make the products affordable to micro enterprises and uh, other uh, media, uh, small enterprises, especially up to Uko Mashinani, so that people don't see, like, if you have insurance cover, then you must be in another category. Uh, now, my last question goes to Fred Wazwa. Fred Wazwa, thank you for really being bold. And you know, most SMEs, once you die, their businesses do not see the second or third anniversary. Of late, you have seen, even Mambo Ya Uribi, people are fighting over uh, the wealth. How do we really reposition and educate our MSMEs in such a way that through the corporate governance, we can really prepare our, uh, 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 our people, our children, our directors of the company so that we avoid such kind of uh, mess, especially once the owner has passed on. Thank you so much. Th thank you very much. I'd like to invite, there's a lady who has a question, um, who would like to ask a question as, so you can as he said, aggregate the questions, as he said, Dr. Kip, aggregate the questions so we can respond to them efficiently. You could come to the podium. It's been sanitized. So introduce yourself and tell us your organization, then quickly and briefly ask your question. Uh, hi, my name is Sylvia Tellens. Um, I'm here because I am one of you guys. I'm, I'm an SME and I'm struggling to get my business ahead. And my business name is uh, Karu Trading. Karu, Karu Trading. <laughs> services. Now, uh, the question is for you guys uh, is uh, regarding a uh, financial part. Now, you say you can either get finances be, uh, from either borrowing or savings. Now, uh, for a person like me, I don't have the capability to do both because of the scalability of the business that I'm trying to get on to the point. Now, uh, what I've been trying to do is I've been trying to look for investors in Kenya and it's really hard for me to get to that point. Now, um, how does a person like me address an issue like that? Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And we'll have the third one, then we can now have the responses. Um, just let the gentleman sanitize the microphone and podium. Then, thank you very much. Then you can now. Good morning. My name is Wambugu Gichohe. I am a business consultant and I'm also an innovator. My question mainly is the CEC for Nairobi County. And the reason uh, I've thought through this is the circumstances that we find ourselves in as a result of COVID. When COVID came, as you have been told before, many businesses closed. So you are at home. What do you do? You need to innovate. You need to eat. Now, this country and many more in Africa have no, or rather have little, if any, focus on cottage industries. And this is where I'm heading now. My question is the area of cottage industries. What is a cottage industry? A cottage industry is that production that you do at home in your kitchen or in a dedicated room in your home to serve an identified need. In this country, in countries around Africa, very, very little effort has been put to encourage cottage industries. Buona CEC, is it possible that you can prioritize that? Because I will give you an example, and that's why I came with this on here. During COVID, my daughter and I went into production mode, into uh, innovation mode, and we produced our hair oil that regrows hair where there was once hair. So if you have an airport, there's already a product. But now, being a, a small producer, you are still expected to go through the same process as a big guy who goes through KIE, KEBS, which is fine, but there's no way you are shown how to do that. You've got to do the, exactly the same way EAI would do the same. With a focus on cottage industries, there would certainly be processes through which these home industries are built to, uh, to, to grow. And if you look at world statistics, you'll find like, like in the UK, the big companies only contribute 20% of okay. the GDP. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bonambogo. And <laughs> we can't help but wonder whether you had all that here before your product. 
<laughs> before your product. That is one of the main take homes. But anyway, a very good question. So I'll allow uh, Bona Musumba to begin respond to some of the questions in regards to SME hubs. Um, I mean, you're in government. I'm sure you're ready for to be one of the main people being asked uh, the questions. So maybe you could begin with yours, then we'll pick the rest up. Um, thank you very much. As I said uh, at the beginning, um, government is a bureaucracy. We work within law. And for us to be able to act on, it, on any proposition, it has to be within law. Uh, and I said we are coming up with a, a trade policy. And uh, within this trade policy, we have already captured uh, what he was uh, asking about. Not only cottage industry, nowadays you will find that most of our businesses are e-businesses. They, they don't actually have a premises. Previously, we used to license only premises within commercial uh, areas for them to do business. But we have realized that maybe the next uh, 10 or so years, we might not have people in the commercial uh, places. So as we are coming up with this policy, uh, we recognize that uh, this is an area that we must uh, focus on. Uh, he talked about, there, there was also a question on um, SME. We, we, we have actually an SME revolving fund. And uh, we have money actually at the moment. We were given 30 million. But we could not use this million because we did not have a, a legal framework. And that's what we are trying to work on. And hopefully, uh, in, the next, uh, in the next financial year, the, the, the legal framework will, be, will have been enacted and we'll be able uh, to give this, um, uh, these funds. Uh, prior to coming in into, uh, uh, into place the county government, uh, the national government used to have a revolving fund. We inherited this, but we do not have uh, the legal framework, and that's what we are trying to work on. Um, I think those were the areas that uh, they really wanted to, me to look at, but I must emphasize that that can only be done within a legal framework, and we are working towards achieving the same. All right, thank you. And then we had a question for Dr. Kipnyatich. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think most of you, uh, I agree that insurance has been elitist before. But we are also waking up to that reality that we cannot just remain in an elite position. If you look at insurance penetration in our economy, it is roughly around 2.5% of GDP, which is very low. And uh, we would like to see greater uptake of managing risk. It's not that you are not managing risk. You do but in a different way from the way we in the insurance industry do it. For example, the biggest risk mitigator in our economy is Arambe. You know, when there's a problem in the community, we rally around ourselves, we, we, we form a WhatsApp group, and within an hour, the problem is solved. And so it's a form of insurance. It's just that it's an inefficient uh, way of insurance. Some of you go to church and you get a, a prayer. The pastor, you pay a premium to him and you're off. So it, it is us also in the insurance industry to understand how the marketplace works. So we are changing. We as Jubilee, for example, we are changing the way we distribute insurance. For example, if you now go to your bank, the bank has our products. So it's just that we have not branded most of them, but you will see a bank counter. The other one is online. You can buy motor insurance now from Jubilee online. So just get the download the app uh, and you can buy motor insurance. You can buy medical insurance. You can buy uh, education insurance for your children online. You can buy your own individual life insurance. So all these are on the online platforms. So if you go to our website, then you will find all those products and they are being priced for you. So it's no longer an elite thing. Uh, so we are climbing down to where the Wananchi are because this is where the opportunity in the economy lies in, in at the SME space. So a lot of these things are beginning to happen. And 
you, you can even ask your agent or whoever is your intermediary that deals with your consultancy and you will get there. I just want to mention something about um, Gishuki who talk about uh, that hair loss product and cottage industries. You see, uh, what made countries like Switzerland famous for chocolates is a product of cottage industries. Those are done by SMEs in the villages, but they don't do it individually. They do them as cooperatives, village cooperatives. So I would like to urge our CEC here to develop you know, laws that encourage business consolidation through an aggregator. I know, uh, take time to understand how KTDA works. I know it's being fought now, <laughs> and I don't know why forces are fighting it, because it's the only crop that functions in Kenya, and people are fighting it. So I was like, okay, if you fight this one, what else is left? Coffee's died, maize dead, uh, sisal dead, cotton dead, now they want tea dead. I don't know for what uh, some reason. But the key thing is, if we encourage people to consolidate, economies call it economies of scale, which is advantages of large size. If we come together, okay, and we then uh, spread the risk and spread the costs of running something, we will then succeed together. Kenya has the most, the highest number of cooperatives in Africa. So we need now to say that which we have gotten right, how do we enhance it? How do we create more KTDAs in other industries? So that then we are all aggregating and so therefore somebody like him with a product, how can we aggregate them and we market them collectively and he pays a small fee? That is how business is run globally. So we need to think through and come together. This thing of going into business alone, utakufa pekeako. But <laughs> if we stay together, if we hang together, we will succeed together. And I, I wanted, uh, sorry, I wanted Stanley to also contribute to the insurance aspect. But mm -hmm. Dr. Keep, uh, I was hoping you could also address, um, uh, which I know probably was also mentioned, what the lady asked about getting investors. How can these SMEs get investors? Um, okay. Because that she speaks for a larger group of individuals and companies. Okay. Now, there are two things I would want to mention about what she raised. One is, please get a mentor, somebody to mentor you. A lot of these mentors are for free. Most of them are people who have, had, have gone through that journey. So I would suggest for her, get a business mentor, somebody to take you through. Because they have been there themselves. Okay? So get a business mentor. And then number two, please, most of you have reached the stage where you need to formalize your business. Get proper legal paperwork, registration, so you have a registration certificate. Get a board, I'm sure some of you can constitute a board of people who understand how to run a business, corporate governance. Please formalize your accounts. Please operate now by having accounts. To set up accounts is not difficult. So get somebody who can assist you to get your accounts ready, and then have three year audited. Then you will be ready for people now to bring in the capital, because they are coming to check on you. But if you go and just say, trust me, <laughs> that business doesn't work like that. If you go and say, I have my three year audited accounts, Look, I have my board, and these are serious people, okay? And these are the minutes of our discussions. It doesn't have to be very sophisticated minutes, but these are the minutes of our discussion, and you can see. And we have this business plan, okay? Because when I inject money, I'm not looking so much at your past. It's just a guide. I'm interested in where are you going in the future, your business plan. So if I can see your business plan, the company is run well, and they are proper governance structures. But many of them are afraid of KRA. KRA is part of formalizing. You must pay your due taxes. Because if you are, if you are in this business of hepering uh, taxes, no, no outsider will touch you because 
they are afraid that if they put capital into your business, it could be swallowed by KRA tomorrow. <laughs> so make sure you pay your taxes. It's part of compliance. How the taxes is used is another matter. We can discuss it separately. <laughs> but you must comply. Compliance is a very important thing. Right, Thank Stanley. You. It's on. Thank you very much. Um, is insurance elitist? Um, I think that question I needed to respond to. Um, many years ago, um, when probably the concept of the umbrella came, uh, if you were seen carrying an umbrella when it is raining, probably thought you are an elite, um, <laughs> and, and probably you're very advanced. Uh, and I'm sure in the villages, uh, people would even frown and start to understand where you got that umbrella. Today, all of us have uh, umbrellas in our cars. I'm um, sure if we open uh, ladies' handbags, you might likely find like a small umbrella in there. Or three. Yes. So what am I getting to? Uh, in the past, insurance maybe was seen um, as a product for the elite, uh, people who have money and therefore have more to spend on insurance. But we, if, uh, once we understand insurance from a need perspective, then you realize that uh, it is for all of us. And insurance companies have worked very hard, uh, particularly the, at Madison Group, we've worked very hard to ensure that we have a product for every Kenyan. We have a product for every small businesses. And some, sometimes to get people paying small premiums, then you have to innovate. So we go through banks, uh, we distribute through banks, we go through online platforms, and they are safe um, and tested. And Basically, we try to even get into groups uh, to ensure that people can pull together and buy their own um, insurance through those platforms. But importantly, um, insurance is not for the elite because if the material uh, risk uh, comes, if the risk materializes, um, then the, the heart is more if you don't have uh, resources to protect yourself. So indeed, um, most other uh, wealthy people may not need insurance, but for us who are working hard as SMEs, need it more than the bigger guys, because the bigger guys maybe have more funds or seeing funds where they can uh, draw funds or they're able to mobilize capital quickly. For you as a business owner, uh, once you look at the risk, you realize um, if a risk materializes, then you'll have a problem getting back your business running. So insurance is for you. and. The less you, the smaller you are as a business, probably the higher the need uh, to ensure that you insured. Thank you. Okay, Bonabonio, then we can go to Bonawaso. Okay, just to uh, add to that, uh, the, the question is that is it cheap to buy insurance or is it expensive? Now, the insurance industry has come up with many innovative solutions. You can come up as uh, the SME a group and get, uh, say for example, life insurance cover for all of you. And because you are many, you'll be able to pay just a very little premium and get yourself insured. So we have solutions that ensure people of specific industries, people of specific interests, and, and that works uh, for all of us. Now it can still apply even for the, the machines, the products, if you know your friend is dealing with the same types of machines, you can pull them together so that you get a cheap insurance cover. So it's not, you don't, don't think about yourself, but think about your network and how can you leverage on your network to um, spend little and still get protected and grow your business by getting your savings in place and uh, getting your investments to expand and expand and expand. Thank you very much. So, Bonawaswa, there was the question on helping with the transitioning. Correct. Then you could also probably also just chip into how to get investors. Absolutely. Um, I, I think uh, uh, talking about succession, basically transitioning your business, um, you, one needs to get prepared uh, in terms of transition, and uh, three levels of transition. One is when you get injured or disabled, disabled you're not able to run your business. What happens? Uh, and then two is, in the event you die, uh, what happens to your business? And then three is retirement. 
uh, because I always say it is, it is coming. It is coming. Whether we like it or not, we'll have to reach somewhere where the body tells you I can't wake up, even if the spirit is willing to do that. So those three things must be prepared. And one of the first is, is, uh, is when you get injured, and we have to talk about insurance, which is very important. But the most important thing is what Dr. Terry has continued to speak about, it's governance. Is that when you are running a small business, you need to have a board. You need to have people that will help you to think and work with you. So in the event you get disabled, they can quickly know who is in the organization that can stand in and start running the business while you are getting treated in a hospital and if you get better you can come back to your, your business. Which means your business can continue running it. And then, and then two is at a very particular level there must be levels of trust. Because I know I have run small, I mean I've, I've started off from one person running the business with two staff, or three staff. But sometimes you trust yourself much more than you trust your people. You reach somewhere where you say no, no I must trust my people because one day I'm not going to be in this office and they will have to run the business unless you want the business to die with you. And that's what I think we don't want to have. We want business to move from level one, which is you, to level two where you are leaving it for other people to run so you, the, money, the business makes money for you rather than you waking up in the morning and working for it. So we must have a board governance structure that in the event of anything happening, the people can come together quickly and make decisions in terms of how the business moves forward. This, the third level is the fact that in the event you die, what happens to the business? That transition is very critical. And one of the things that we're having a lot more in this country is the fact that most of us will die and the business dies. I have a friend of mine who used to run a business. We started with him almost at the same time in 2000. He started in 2006. He was running a medical business. And in 2013 or 14, he passed on. And the business basically closed. Because even the wife did not know what was going on. You get it. He didn't have a board. And every time I would tell him, look, you form a small board. And he said, it's costly to form a board. Now, <laughs> if you think it's costly to form a board, run without. It is even more costly for your family because when you die, the business will die because nobody will trust anybody else who has not been coming through in the business. So there must be a succession plan, but then two, there must be a board that helps you to run. Three is the fact that when you die, it is important to have things like trusts. Trusts. I know it's a, a new concept, but it's a very important concept. In the UK, people pass on their assets using trusts. A trust is where you are deciding and saying, when I die, my business will run by, by the board. My child will be simply be a board member to make sure that the, board, the, money, the, the business runs. However, there will be a trust where the funds or income or revenue or, or, I mean, or profits are going to be put into to help my family I mean, continue forward. So that your, your family does not start using your business the second day you die. You get it. So trust management becomes important. I know you know about Karume Trust. It is one which has been represented a lot in the in newspapers. And that's an important one. He really has managed that business using trust. I know there were a couple of challenges, but those challenges are managed by courts. But the trust moves forward. I started managing a trust in, 1990, in 1998, which had been running since 1956. Managing assets of an old man, Muzungu man, who passed on. But the, the, the business was put in a trust so that the, even the directors of the business are actually appointed by the trustees of the trust. So that you make sure that your, your business runs on and in, the, in, in, in perpetuity. So it's very important to look at trust management. And we are very good in terms of trust, what we call estate planning. We have a whole department in terms of estate planning as Octagon Africa. And this is the kind of things we'll be able to do for you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I believe we've got another question. Do you have any other questions from the, from the audience? Yes, you could just come to the, you could come to the podium and ask your questions. So just as a pointer that um, you can um, tell us your name, the organization you represent very briefly, and your question. It's Thank on. you very much. My name is Azulu Thomas. I am the first secretary or the head of economy, trade, and investment under the Zambian embassy here in Nairobi. 
Uh, basically, my, my question will come later. Allow me, moderator, to just make a brief uh, comment. Um, I've attended for the first time, because I'm new in Kenya, the SMEs Expo and the conference. And I can tell you that uh, Kenya is on the right path. You know, reading in your brochures that 80% uh, of the workforce in Kenya fall under the SMEs. That is a very big encouragement, and this is uh, one of my biggest learning caves ever since I came here. To learn how you are managing the, the SMEs, how you are developing them, and I think uh, keep it up. Zambia has a lot to learn from uh, your achievements. I know Kenyans are going to say we have not reached there, but I think you're on the right path, and uh, moving this direction, we'll see a lot of progress. I've heard from one of the panelists here, talking about insurance. Um, I invite you to invest in Zambia's insurance. There's a very big space for you people. I say so because uh, there's a very big gap between Zambia's trade and Kenya's trade. We've been very friendly to each other, but we don't trade with each other. And I think we need to change uh, the scenario by also opening up the SMEs here in Kenya to have a platform, do business trips to Zambia. And I can assure you, you get a lot of, lot of business because I've seen the quality of the things you manufacture here and the quality of things on display. And I think we might not be at that level. And uh, Kenya can tap into this technological transfer, goods transfer, services transfer to Zambia. So my office is very open. Um, those that are dealing with SMEs and those that are managing them, let's sit down and see where we can link up so that we can better business in the two, two countries. And also on the medical, I think we need a lot of medical uh, facilities in Zambia. That is another issue you can look at so that you can invest in the medical services. I've seen the standards of the medical services here. Um, I'm happy to report that one of your hospitals here, which is in Kijabe, they've opened a, a branch in Zambia, and I'm sure they're doing very well. I think it's a medical hospital. So these are the things I want to encourage Thank you. Kenyans to do the interlinkages, intertrade, so that we can benefit mutually both countries. Now, my question is that we are living in a very changed scenario because of the COVID-19. Um, however, we need to actually rise up and still do business within the epidemic. So what is the government doing in Kenya? Uh, Any one of you can actually take it up. What are they doing to actually ensure that capital and the financial institutions in Kenya ensure that they continue funding the small scale and the medium enterprise? Because this is key. That 80% employment by the SMEs should not be lost because it will have a lot of effects on the ground. So is there a deliberate policy by the government in the midst of the pandemic that the funding to the SMEs and also financial institutions, funding to the SMEs are not curtailed? Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that question and we'll have it, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll probably devolve it and have um, the Nairobi Acting County Secretary respond to that after that. For what Nairobi is doing, you will not, uh, you're not bound to speak for the national government. That's why I said we are devolving it. <laughs> uh, we'll have, there's a lady with a question, then we can pick it up from there. Hello, good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Monica Masege. I am the CEO and founder of iHotelier Consultancy. I am in hospitality. Uh, the company started in 2015, and uh, it has survived post-election violence, uh, all the other ups and downs, as well as COVID. So in hospitality industry, we find that we have so many colleges and universities that have these courses for hospitality. But once the student has finished learning the program, uh, then what? Because we have a lot of students who have studied hospitality who don't have jobs. So what iHotelier Consultancy has done has come up with a program where we train them, then we place them for internship here for three months, 
and then now we take them out of the country for a one year paid internship. This we are doing because many of our youth in hospitality have the potential not to necessarily be employed uh, in the hotel, but to actually become hospitality entrepreneurs. Now, my question come in uh, to the panel. What is the government doing uh, to strengthen relations with the countries where we are posting these students? Because we have a very tarnished uh, opinion where if you go to the Middle East, if you go to Dubai or Qatar or Bahrain, you're going to be mistreated, you're going to be thrown out of the streets. That is the notion all of us have. But for sure, I can tell you, I have been a hotelier for eight years and five years, sorry, on four years, I have been in a five-star hotel in Qatar. And the experience was amazing. So we find that in hospitality industry, you can join as a housekeeper, but the promotions they have there, you find yourself someday, you are a supervisor. You can start as a kitchen steward, washing the dishes. The next thing you know, you have put yourself to a department where you're a barrister. You're now bringing coffee. But we have a very difficult situation where every time we say someone is leaving the country to go work in a UAE, they're either going to be mistreated or something like this. Currently, we cannot even post any student directly from Kenya to Abu Dhabi because we don't have good relations with them. So what is the government doing about that? And then uh, also another question is, uh, what are we doing to separate those who are doing, uh, for example, they are posting people for house help jobs. There's that, there's that group. But there is the corporate, there's the corporate side where we are actually posting for five-star hotels, other industries. Because you see here in Kenya, yes, we have hotels, but we have really quite suffered COVID in hospitality. It's, I can say hospitality was the most hit uh, industry. But you find that in Qatar, having World Cup next year, it's, they're actually going to pick up in hospitality. Uh, we have more than 700 hotels in Bahrain, more than 700 hotels in Dubai, more than 700 hotels in Qatar. You okay. can't count them all, and every day these hotels are coming up. But what are we doing for our youth who would like to join hospitality and not have that notion of, if I go, I'm going to be mistreated? Because why? The government has actually put this that traveling to these countries, you have to go through all these phases. Yes, we are doing that. But even the other countries are also telling us, your countries do not trust us uh, to have you guys on board. So what is the government doing about that? Okay, thank, thank you, you very much for that. Um, well, what is somewhat unfortunate, we don't have um, a government official on the panel who can actually respond to your specific questions. But the good thing is that we are live on TV, this footage is available online, and so we shall see how to pick up the same, um, to that concern, uh, because of the, the perception that is there and the narrative as well as, like you've uh, said, um, your allegation that, you know, even the relations between the different countries. Um, but that said, it's also good to hear that Kenya has been given some somewhat endorsement uh, from Zambia, and that is a good opportunity. Gentlemen, you've had this opportunity for business for you in Zambia. Um, Absolutely. Uh, Dan, just to mention to a uh, colleague from Zambia, we, we are doing business in Zambia. We bought Alexander Forbes business in Zambia in 2019, uh, but we have been in Zambia since 2017. Um, fantastic country, yeah, uh, a lot of opportunities, and I think we can do a lot of trade with uh, Zambia if that comes through. Thanks. Good. We have an early bloomer here already. He was already there before the endorsement. <laughs> um, th thanks, Buonawaswa. And there was the question that um, we said we'd, we'd have devolved, we'll go to the acting county secretary of Nairobi County. What is the government doing to ensure, you know, capital and, you know, financial institutions um, are still going to fund SME. So from Nairobi County, what are you, if anything, again, uh, doing to ensure that uh, the SMEs still have access to some sort of credit or funding in general? It doesn't have to be credit. Um, thank you. I will answer on what we are doing as a county to help SMEs. And uh, you will realize that um, 
we have reduced our permit, uh, the money you pay for our permits. If you are in the hospitality industry, we use uh, the number of uh, chairs to calculate the amount of money you pay. And you realize that you've been paying 10,000, you are now paying less than 5,000. So we have actually reduced the amount of money they are paying for their permits, and that is what we are, we are doing. Okay, then we have um, the question, the, the, the hotelier, like I said, uh, some of these may not be addressed by anyone here specifically. But I don't know if any of the gentlemen may have just a comment on the same, just in terms of for businesses that are facing such challenges that have um, some sort of either diplomatic concerns or there are some rules that have been put out or narratives that are put out by the government that may be stifling the growth. What, how should they weigh that space? Because then that I think we can address here. I'm okay, probably it. let me make a comment on, it just goes to what I said earlier on, the importance of a ministry of SMEs. Because then that, those questions would then be addressed through our diplomatic channels, cab cabinet uh, discussions, specific to SMEs. Because if you look at the way business is organized in Kenya, it is at the government level, at the policy level, it is all geared to the big boys. So what we need now is a whole government structure, both at national and county level, that then focuses on SMEs. If you look at, say, Nairobi City County government, I mean, the people who vote a governor, 99% actually come from the SME market. But when they arrive in City Hall, they now look at the big boys. So there's a mismatch. So we need government structures and mindsets that then focus solely on SMEs because of the value that they drive, which is around the number of people and the impacts they create. So it is a very, I cannot overemphasize it. It's just too obvious. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Madam Musumba, you wanted to, you could yes, give us yes, a final uh, comment. Uh, Dr. Adi, I can assure you that uh, at the county government, we have uh, a trade, uh, trade uh, uh, sector and we have a, 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 a unit specifically for SMEs. So maybe we need now to bring it up to the level of a sector for us to be able to, to match your, your suggestions. But the biggest test for that is, if you look at the vehicles that are then supposed to manage organized trade for SMEs, all of you know it, how do they look like? They have a wire mesh because they are seeing, they are seeing you as a violent guy. <laughs> So we, if it's just a mindset, you know, it's very important that we look at SMEs as contributors to the economy and as contributors to the economy, they need to be treated with dignity. Yeah. Keep responding. Yes, yes. And um, I'm sure, Dr. Tari, uh, recently, uh, you, you know we are in a new dispensation. And uh, since the coming into effect of this new dispensation, you've noticed that there is a lot of change in Nairobi. And I can assure you that uh, from then onwards, you will see a different Nairobi. Okay. I'll keep on checking. I'll <laughs> keep on checking. Let's see. <laughs> and so my final one is just briefly to Bona Musumba. And just briefly because we are meant to have our closing remark. One of the concerns that many of the SMEs will have when they are planning or intending to do business with government is either you need to know someone, you need to do kickbacks, it is laden with corruption. And so what happens is that the good guys are kicked out and it becomes a haven for all the wrong people. What specifically is being done? Because their pronouncement, we, are an, we, we do not condone corruption, but what actually, to, to give some sense of confidence that the gentleman who is who, who made hair growth formula with his daughter can come and get a tender for the older people in the county, maybe. Um, thank you very much. Um, we realize that um, before the new dispensation, uh, uh, I'll give an example of licensing. Licensing was done from City Hall. And it was very tedious for people to walk from uh, the wards to City Hall uh, for them to come and be, to get their licenses. And out of these uh, uh, things could happen because of the congestion at City Hall. But we have now devolved 
to the sub-counties. We are even headed to the wards so that our people at the ward level will not have to come to City Hall uh, to look for services uh, that they need at the ward level. And this reduces the, the reason for uh, corruption. So we have devolved our services to the lowest level. Wouldn't that also devolve the corruption, potentially? Uh, to, to be sincere, corruption most of the time is a two-way process. But in a situation where uh, the person demanding for corruption has no reason for him to be corrupt, then there will be no reason for a, a bribe being requested for. What I mean to say, uh, when you make it hard for somebody to get a license, then that person looks for a way to get that license. But when you make it very easy for that person to get a license, there will be no reason for that person to look for a way to bribe a person. Thank you very much, Bwana Musumba. We will leave you at that before, before you, you feel attacked. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Julius Kimetich, the regional CEO of Jubilee Holdings Limited and definitely a thought leader. Dr. Jeras Musumba, he's the acting county secretary of the county of Nairobi City. Then we have, um, after that, we have Stanley Karanja, the head of group business, Madison Life Assurance. We have Fred Waswa, the group CEO of Octagon. And last but not least, next to me is Brana Bongo, Capex. He's the operations manager at Capex. And so at this point, I'm going, we'll just remain seated here, and I will invite uh, James Sogoti, the Nation Media Group's uh, general manager for commercial, to give us the closing remarks as we come to a close of this session. Thank you very much, Dan. Uh, this is a wonderful opportunity, and um, I would like, just like to say uh, solving the problems of SMEs is really solving the problems of, or challenges of our country. And solving the problems of uh, SMEs is really solving the problems of uh, uh, you know, uh, the continent, Africa. Solving the problems of the continent, Africa, is solving the problems of the world. So what we are doing here is really solving problems of the world. I love SMEs. They are wonderful people. They have aggression with precision. They know what they want. All they need is support, sufficient support. And I would like to align to what Dr. Julius uh, Kimiot said. You know, we need a ministry that just worries and takes care of SMEs and MSMEs. That way, then we'll start having, uh, you know, significant growth. When we did economics, and those of us who are doing economics, you know, it is the microeconomics that builds the macroeconomics, and that answers the big national questions. So this is it. We are very passionate uh, as NMG in really looking at how do we get partners. This is a space within which we need collaborators. We all need to collaborate, come together. In fact, the entire even media industry to come together and address this question of SMEs. What do we do? Because we've been talking about this challenge for a long time. Probably it's time we start now seeing solutions and we'll be solving solutions for our country and for future. Let me speak a bit to education. And even um, our higher uh, institutions of learning, when we are looking for places of internship for our students, we all run to you know, the blue chip places, government, you know, all those places. I think we need to change that model and start going to SMEs. Then we start building capacities and real engagements that are really solving challenges that are there uh, in our country. I would like to thank our partners. I would like to thank Kenya National Chamber of Commerce. I would like to thank KEPSA. I would like to thank all our partners. I would like to thank our panelists and um, everyone who has really participated in this. Uh, all those who have visited just to experience and see what is going on here. Uh, it's happening today. We'll have an opportunity of still going on um, until tomorrow. Uh, the only key thing that we all need to do is really adhere and observe to and observe the um, COVID rules, uh, the MOH guidance on that. And the big idea here is this. 
Whereas we have the challenge of COVID in our world, we must still remain as an economy that still operates. We will not lock ourselves in our houses. We have to keep the economy going while we observe the government regulations. You're wonderful people because you've observed those regulations. And I think that way we'll start getting to the next agenda of resilience, recovery, and then we sustain uh, this economy. So tomorrow we are open the whole day until uh, uh, 5 o'clock. So we welcome uh, those who still would like to learn, uh, come and experience the exhibitions. And um, I think that's it for me. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we are grateful and really, really, really excited. Maybe just one more thing, Dan. At Nation Media Group, we have solutions for SMEs. We have a special uh, product within uh, our digital platform, within the print publication, within our uh, uh, television, Within all the assets that we have across the five countries that we are operating in, we have solutions for SMEs. So don't worry. Come, tell us this is the challenge you have to communicate. We will deliver content for you. We will deliver advertising for you because it is in our interest that you grow. When you grow, NMG grows. When we all grow, then our country grows. So we have solutions for all of us. So thank you so much, and I'm grateful. Thank you very much, Bonasogoti. We appreciate you, and we appreciate everybody who's been part of this. Like he said, they'll still, the exhibition stalls are still open today and tomorrow, so those of us who may be watching us from your workplaces or otherwise, you still have the opportunity of doing this tomorrow. Thank you once again to our panelists and to also our audience who have been part and parcel of this. At this point, we now go off air, and we shall be having a great afternoon of enjoying what is in store at the exhibition stalls. My name is Dan Mwangi. Thank you for staying with NTV.